Hello, we're here with Simone White, the famous producer, entrepreneur, uh, drummer, musician um, that used to live in San Francisco, but now is living in Sydney, Australia. Welcome, Simone. Hey, how you doing there, Rob? I'm doing wonderful. Um, so... Um, I'm doing these interviews. I'm doing uh, some music courses uh, that uh, I'm going to be posting online. And I'm interviewing everybody from students to uh, my mentors to people that just, you know, have, have done music but are not doing music or um, have not done music and now doing music and people that are doing, you know, different things in, in the music business. So I'm just kind of opening it for uh, opening it up for all kinds of, of different things. Cool. So um, I'll start off by asking you, uh, when did you first discover music and how old were you when you got into music? Good Lord. Um, fortunately, music was in my household. It wasn't just that everyone or most of us played. It was just music in my household. So I would say maybe music really hit me about the age of five. That's, that's pretty much it by hearing it. Um, probably one of my first discoveries that made me really into um, into music was probably the first Headhunters album. <laughs> I guess, is that clear enough? Yeah, and you said, um, I remember you telling me your mom was a drummer and, and, and so um, you would, she would teach you or something when you were a little kid? Yeah, my mom um, originally was a, a drummer as well as she played a little bit of piano and um, some other percussion vibes and stuff and sang. But um, she taught me later on in my, um, probably when I hit about nine, she started working on me a little bit before I just kind of goofed around and did whatever I wanted to do. And one of my older brothers played drums as well. Um, and... It was just mostly, though, I think the biggest influence was overall that there was music in every single room. And I've got two older brothers and an older sister, and my mother and my father played a lot of music. And I guess that was one of my biggest inspirations, just music being everywhere. So I guess that's one of the main things. And I started playing drums around five. I had a kid, you know, one of those little kid kids. The little, the little junior kids. Yeah. Made out of cardboard. And, and I tore that up, and then they bought me a decent kit. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So were you um, in music courses in school? Did you take band, uh, orchestra, symphonic band, jazz band, marching band? Were, did you do any of the, uh, uh, the arts? Did you grow up in San Francisco, by the way? Were you in, in, in the music program? Or were you, in? I should say, in the public school system in San Francisco? Um, I, would, I got into, I, I guess around year six, I, took, I started studying piano and um in junior high school and before that i had i never played in the band at all but i was taking piano and i was doing that for a little bit and i thought of course that's silly because i was still playing drums i never stopped so i thought you know piano was silly but i was learning some theory and things like that and i continued to play drums but i dropped out of out of school bands yeah and then um what was your practice routine when you were when you were playing drums? Or let's say that you uh, you were in high school. Were you were you practicing every day? Were you playing? Um, if you were practicing, did you have teachers or a routine that you were doing? Uh, if you didn't have teachers, did you? How did you learn? Did you play to records? Um, like how? What was your method of of teaching yourself or or learning? Um, I had mentors, uh, my older brothers being that they played music a little bit. I think my, yeah, my second oldest brother was a drummer as well, as well as guitar. He was still playing drums actively then. He was gigging a little bit and their extended, you know, their, their friends were my play brothers, um, which you've probably met some of them, the Allen brothers at one point, David Allen. Oh my goodness. Yeah, remember we talked about them long ago. They've known me since I was in diapers. Wow. And Dave, <laughs> David and Jabbar. What was Jabari. 
Jabari, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes. So they were my brother's, you know, best friends. And they had, you know, uh, uh, as we would say, a posse of great musician, actors, artsy friends. And they were, you know, knew me since I was a baby. So I, you know, would watch them and play music with them. And I would, you know, steal methods and listen to records and practice and learn different things and some technique from their drummer friends. And, you know, everybody, I brushed elbows with some famous people. My second oldest brother took lessons for a little while from Narada Michael Walden. Um, so I got to steal concepts and ideas and watch him because I was about nine then, I think, where I was stealing ideas. So I practiced regularly. I mean, I was playing the records or just trying to figure things out on the daily, every day. I would sit there. No one told me. I would do it for, you know, four, five hours. And um, then once I hit about 14, I started playing professionally with David and them, David Allen and, and Jabari, because um, I replaced their drummer. So I was good enough to actually play in a band. I was picked up enough theory and things went on from there. And um, I started kind of getting more pointers from my mom. So I got more into jazz a little bit. Um, and, you know, pr that progressed on to where I started playing in bands as on my own, finding them. Um, and I guess at one point, um, touring and, and being on records, I hit a wall. And I found your ad in, what was it? Uh, Bam, Bam Magazine. Bam yeah. Magazine. And I rang you up. Yeah. So that's, that's been on and off since maybe 92, 93. How old were you when you studied with me? Were you, um, were you in your 20s? I was in probably, I was maybe about 24, 25 when I started studying with you. And then we, you were with me for 10 years? Was it? Um, or, or? At, at, at first, maybe it was about three years, two, three years consistently. Then I would duck out and I would tour and I would do a lot of recordings and I would just disappear. Um, then I came back and I was with you, you know, several years consistently. So it was always, you know, in these spots and then it would be consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So quite some time. On and off. Yeah. On and off. It was a while. Um, and I was just telling my other um, student that I interviewed, um, I taught a lot of the 20 year olds, uh, 20 something. And that was probably the most interesting, interesting time in my life of teaching because they loved my material and uh, there was a lot of energy, of course. People had trouble paying for the lessons, you know, but um, I, but the energy level, you know, was, um, you know, we'd feed off each other. And uh, I always, that was so value, invaluable for me because um, I gained so much energy with my, with my teaching style that way. Um, so all you guys that, that from that BAM magazine ad, you know, that I, I, I ran, it was like every week. And and it wasn't expensive, but I just kept that thing going in there. Uh, I get people from all over the place, you know, which was really amazing. Um, so when you grew up, like, did you have musical mentors? You said your brother was your mentor. Did you have, were there other mentors? Did you have, uh, you know, people outside of school or people in, um, you know, your professional, like, uh, gigging world or uh, touring world or uh, seniors? Did you have any mentors that guided you? Yeah, I, I would say less of, um, probably less of my brothers at some point. It was just neighborhood cats like um there was i can't remember his name but there was i lived around like the musical director from the whispers we i think we you i spoke about that a long time ago and he just was a friend of someone else and i would you know get these pointers from these guys and i would just rub rub elbows with famous people i didn't even know were in these big groups and um just a lot of good pointers from people like that and then you know, um, just kind of bouncing around through different circles and meeting just random people. And when drum clinics were happening, I would go and just be quite inspired. And I was mostly into piano and bass players. That was a big inspiration and going to see people and getting to meet. I met Stanley Clark and he was really, you know, cool and, and, and took the time to talk to me. Um, 
um, I met um, Patatucci, who was super cool, took the time to talk to me. So a lot of people like that. It wasn't always just chasing drummers. It was looking for that just overall music point of view. And wow. just art inspired, me, you know, more than just drummers or anything just musical, it's just art. So I did a lot of, you know, I went, to, I went to school for fashion, merchandising, marketing, and design, as well as during your, the time studying with you, when I disappeared a few times, I went to, I partially lived in LA with my oldest brother, who's an actor. And, and during that time, I, I took a short course at PIT as well. So I was accepted in PIT within a week of handing them a cassette. And they, you know, no internet d during those times. They actually phoned me up and said the drummer from Big Country was there and a couple other big bands that were hiding out, studying, trying to get their chops together and, and advance themselves and try a different point of view. So I got in there and just meeting different people coming through there and um, think back home at one point, like I met Cl Kim Plainfield, rest in peace. He was, I think he was a really nice guy and a super good inspiration as well. Awesome. And you were uh, a good mentor, dude. So what do you, so, you know, well, that's, 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 well, that's a good teacher because I learned a lot. You told me to teach. You gave me the awesome. point of saying when it's time for me to teach. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, so when you um, when you were uh, practicing, did you have a routine that you did to to improve yourself? Did you have a steady? And let's say you're doing like all kinds of different music, and you're 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 writing music and production. Did you have a practice routine you did every day? Like you're you're you're, you're telling me today you got up, you get up at like five in the morning and you go for a bike ride. Did you have a, a routine that you every day you did a, a certain practice routine and work on material, or or did you not? Did you not get a chance to practice? Um, you mean um, in those times in in the past? How in did the I past, practice? yeah, and present too. Oh, definitely the the past. I had ideas, but I wasn't as um, strong rudimental wise and stuff as you as you would know, because you saw the weak spots. Um, so before those times, I sort of had a routine, but I, I was sort of lost, but I would at least work on maybe it was hi hat work. Um, maybe it was just particular types of groove and just my timing or working with um, a click playing those different things. But now. I definitely have a, a really set routine. May it be rudiments, uh, may it be working on odd time, making it feel like four. Um, then the next day might be just going back to not even touching a kit, working on my hands again, working on things, of you know, multi bounces in different hands, working on playing the ride cymbal, still working on swinging better. Um, then there's days where there's, just pad and there's just maybe the other days where I'll do production practice of just mixing. And then I'll go back to um, working on just playing in time and playing with a, a click and, and playing in maybe in seven or five, but not four or four all the time anymore. Just mostly trying to, you know, make everything feel just as good as four or four. Amazing. Yeah. What, who were, um, who are your musical influences? Um, and we're talking like just around the gamut of everything that, that um, you're, you're, you listened to growing up. What were your, who are your musical influences? <laughs> the reason I giggle, cause I'm, I'm you, know, you know, me, I'm pretty, pretty strange. Um, and, you know, it'll go from, of course, Chick Corea. Um, there's a bass player named, um, who's passed, Mick Karn, who used to play in a group called Japan. I was a big fan of that group. It was an alternative kind of a, a indie artsy rock band. Um, the Cure, I'm a big, I was a huge Cure fan. I mean, I still am. Um, I, I guess all the way up to most of the 70s fusion groups and some of the 90s fusion groups, Mahavishnu, um, Weather Report, I was, that definitely was a big weather report because the the Joe keyboard thing, that overall tone. 
Um, good Lord. Um, cameo for Funk. <laughs> um, i trying to think. What else? Um, Led Zeppelin. Um, metal groups. I like a lot of Meshuggah. Of course, everybody's got likes to Meshuggah for, you know, the just the crazy, intense overall drive of that stuff. Um, out of some of the newer stuff, which I was hip to be probably for, before most kids, Animals as Leaders. Um, oh, man, it, it just goes on. I just, I would, we'd be here all day. Yeah. It goes from here to there. <laughs> And a lot of ethnic music, like for instance, um, a lot of Turkish music, a lot of um, a lot of music from just even um, East Indian music as well, stuff like that that just challenges you rhythmically, and you don't think about it. You want to make it feel like four. Just you know, it's 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 different. It just feels great, and it makes you feel like you by listening to it, you forget about what's going on. There, I guess that's what what I'm into. Awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, this scene in SF and let's say the nineties, um, south of the market. And we're kind of talking a little bit about that before. Um, tell me how you got into that. Tell me about Charlie Hunter and, um, you know, you talked about Will Bernard and, um, some of these players and, and, um, I know you introduced me to, uh, uh, Andre Bush, um, and he, all these people were kind of in the South of Market scene. Funny, you mentioned them, and I nearly forget forget a lot of that. I'm going, oh, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I'm like going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Andre, Andre, unfortunately passed. Oh, unfortunately, sorry. Yeah. He was, and he was like, you, I remember you telling me, it's like, you got to play with him because I was, I had to look for people and you were taking a lesson and, and he was, we, we connected, man. He was amazing. Awesome. You know, we had that, we awesome. had that instant connection. Cool. Glad you took the advice. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess how I got into that scene is once I, you know, started doing the recording sessions for, um, well, I joined as a touring member of Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy, I started working with Michael Franti. Maybe that was part of how I got in that scene. I was dabbling into that scene before because just um, being around, being um, the Bay Area kid that people kind of heard about me. And so I started getting pulled into that scene. And then I guess a lot of the East Bay kids, so Charlie, Will Bernard, all those cats, um, Kenny, um, I'm forgetting Kenny's last name, but just everyone was playing in those particular pockets. Um, then I just started doing more, and I guess going out with Michael Franti, and that just brought more attention. So I just became like this guy that, because I could pretty much most of all the stuff I was able to pick up really quickly. So I just became like one of the, the cats that was subbing for everybody. So at that time was uh, there was a lot of work, right? You were playing every night. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes twice a night. Twice a night, and um, um, I remember the the Club Eleven up in the loft. I remember um, <laughs> Up and Down Club. Um, I remember a few of those clubs, and uh, I think you were doing all of them, right? Yeah. Pretty much in up and down, I would, you know, even the up and down, I got into that one, you know, really as it became hot. I would even play sometimes in the upstairs part, you know, for the earlier part of the, you know, like cocktail hour for people getting off South of Market and go downstairs and my trio would be, you know, I would play with my trio down there. And I, you know, sometimes it was a rotating door of musicians that were in the group, but my set trio would normally be Will Bernard and Chris Hansen that you know of the basses. Wow. Who was my longtime writing partner and um, slash musical director, <laughs> who I'm still in touch with to this day. Yeah, Chris is a great guy. Yeah. Um, so um, at that point, did you start to get into production or writing? Because um, I know you were when you were studying with me. You were getting into a lot of writing and sequencing. The sequencing was starting to come out then. 
and we're, yeah. we're uh, sequencing everything and, and some of the technology. Is that when you started getting into that? Yeah, I would say probably probably earlier than that, as I was studying with you, I, I was really getting into that. Um, but as I started working with probably with Chris, having that group, and Chris and I starting to play in other people's bands and doing sessions in other people's group, I started writing more. So even as the drummer and, you know, people thought it just was my name up front, I was actually sitting there writing these parts with Chris. So I would, you know, sit there and learn how to do most of the stuff with Chris. And, and yeah, so that was probably my biggest point, but I always kind of wanted to do production two of my biggest heroes were Bernard Edwards and now Rogers of Chic. Mm. Since probably as a boy. <laughs> so did you buy a bunch of equipment and, and were you getting the latest equipment at the time? Or were you doing pro tools or um, were you doing hard disk recording or were you, did you have tape or recording. what did you do? Hard disk recording. Mo mo mostly hard disk recording. Then later on, um, I guess around the later 90s, I started running um, Cubase on my own and Reason. Um, and I started doing a lot of that stuff at home on my own and then bringing it in and having other people play on top of it and things like that. So I, I guess that would be the, the way I really got into it on my own. Got into the, all the, the, the technology and the, and the software. Yeah. Um, so at, at what point you were doing, you're playing like tons and I know you're, you're, you had tons of work and you're doing production and writing and all these things. At what point in your life did you decide to move to Sydney and what caused that, that change? Cause I, what was, that was, it was 2000 or maybe before 2000 when you moved? No, I've been here since 2006. 2006 okay yeah so what 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 happened did you what made the move let's say that, i guess that's the best question is what made you decide to move it's comedy um so what happened was during you know during the times where you you know san francisco's flourishing because during those times where i was playing on all those gigs and whatnot i was touring every so often um i was doing a lot of jingle work you know, so being able to, you know, memorize stuff, as you might remember, I can memorize things quickly. I would do a lot of jingles. So I would go out and, and do a lot of jingle work and whatnot. And I just kind of felt like things, you know, had sort of flattened out and it was time for a change. But going backwards, how it happened was touring with Michael Franti. We toured here once doing the big, one of the biggest tours ever. So you remember Lollapalooza in America? So there was a tour out here called The Big Day Out, which Lollapalooza got their idea off of. So it would go all through Australia and it would be sponsored by, you know, huge company, skateboard companies. It was really hip. Um, we did that tour during the summer. And it was, you know, we were still at, at you know the baby steps of that, at that band but we were doing super well at the time um and charlie hunter was you know getting ready to leave as we were peaking his group was peaking and we came here and charlie and i were on fire and i was noticed by all these different artists here that wanted me to move here so i nearly moved here during that time which didn't work out but i met a woman and Life happened. We didn't connect. Life happened. We I'm, I came back home. Life went on. Twelve years later, she found me through the, the blessings of internet and came back into my life. And here I am. I decided because San Francisco kind of just, as you know, it's sort of just or the, the, the Bay Area sort of plateaued and other things happened to the area and just I went, why not give it a try? Because I was doing well. I was had options here before. Let's see what it's like. So here I am. And um, I moved, here, moved here fairly quickly. Fairly quickly. And then um, tell me about the scene there. And, and so 
you talked about that you play in, in Melbourne and you commute and and so talk about the um, some of the scene and some of the players that you're playing with there and and um, some of the production you're doing there because I know you said you do a lot of work there and yeah, uh, yeah. you got a lot of clients so talk a little bit about what you what you're doing unfortunately it's not as much as dealing with people that are Australian um, for production, I deal with them a little. Most of my students are here. You know, I do, I do teach with other people over the internet outside of here a bit. Um, unfortunately, I don't work with as many artists here, but um, I, I started, when I first got here, I did the same thing as what I was sort of doing back home as I played in the scene. I jumped in and kind of took, you know, the so-so whatever gigs here and there with the hip kind of jazz groups and kind of funky jazz groups and felt like I was reliving the 90s. <laughs> so I did that for probably a year or so, or maybe two, and then I formed my own project and started you know, playing with that around. We were doing really well. And then I just went, it just feels like the same story. I didn't need to move somewhere else to do the same thing. So I just kind of went into um, seclusion of studying more of the production stuff to be even better. Um, and then got my own space. And that's what I'm doing mostly is doing remote recording. So I'm doing a lot of stuff with people in, in still in the States. But now that the technology is here, I'm working more with people from wherever. I'm, I'm hopefully going to be doing something with a, uh, artists from uh, Sudan soon. And then, how do you meet these uh, clients? Do you is it is it word of mouth or are you um, are uh, is it is it that you're doing a production and um, somebody somebody hears it and they contact you? How how do you get these? How are you getting these different projects? There's still a lot of word of mouth, and you know, um, fortunately, doing pretty well with past relationships. So it's still a lot of that people coming back from this or someone's heard something else and that person told them about you. But I still, you know, we can advertise all we want and do all that stuff all we want. But I think the biggest part of it is still word of mouth of keeping, you know, decent relationships going. That's the, that's the key. Are you doing a lot of social media too are you are you um do you put videos out or um audio i i know i get audio from you i i, I get i know you send me different samples uh, are you doing that constantly sending stuff out to people it's like oh look what i'm doing here's here's a sample of my latest um you know project or something um i had been doing that quite a bit and I've fallen off that quite a bit and I even disconnected from a little bit of of social media now I'm actually going full on because I feel as though captive audience right now it's you know people you know with any you know they're they're at home more so they're looking at media and whatnot and they're it's it's time to actually do it so I've started doing more um even doing little quick drum videos. Like even when I do videos for students, I've been putting th things up like in between of grooves that I might be working on for a client and I might leak a little bit of a keyboard line or a bass line on it. So you get to hear it in context. And so little bits like that, and that's been getting a lot more attention. So that's been helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so you talked about that you're, you're teaching in schools now over there. No so. longer. Um, I, was teaching, I was teaching in elementary school, but I'm going to be teaching in a university soon. That's coming okay. up. Okay, That's well, talk, talk about that. Talk about your, your experience. And you, I remember on the phone you told me you were doing mallets and uh, percussion yeah. and timpani and um, snare drum. So talk about your curriculum that you've been doing with the, with the kids, both in elementary school and in uh, when you're going to college. So that was my previous stuff. I had been with this one. I was with a music um, agency that have – so 
a lot of schools here don't just have music like we used to coming up just in that school and they have the equipment in that school. There's an outside company that was bringing music into these schools and they, they would bring their own um, tutors in. So I was with them for maybe six years um, part time, even though I was still doing my own thing. You know, that, that was a great side thing. I would jump in and I was conducting. So I was going into different schools as well as um, bringing some of those kids back privately and teaching them. So I was teaching some mallet stuff. So I would, you know, you know, popular tunes. Some kids would go, we want to play these particular songs as solo pieces, as well as we had a 50 piece group that won a lot of awards. So I would go in and just get the kids to understand basic chord uh, movements and get some basic reading. So nothing really too difficult because they were just five, you know, year five and um, four sometimes. But um, after that, I would get some kids that would graduate on to play in the symphony or they were good enough to, I would start mentoring them, them enough to where I would put them into playing with adults. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But coming up, the next challenge is I was thinking of, okay, well, we're going through so much right now. Why don't I go back and, you know, maybe get another degree and take another course? Then um, I applied to another audio school and the people saw the resume and the guy that was doing the interviewing rang me up on the phone and said, I know who you are. Because I was like, you know, I'm not hyping myself. I was just like, I'm just one of study and maybe maybe get in and do some some sort of tutoring because you know you have a audio recording and you have drums there and i think i could be of use and the guy went i know who you are so looks like i'll be doing some master classes as well as studying there so that's that's jmc music academy which they are in partner from here they're in partner with berkeley wow yeah that's incredible so I've been sitting in during the pandemic, sitting in on conferences that have been on Zoom, Zoom meetings and, um, you know, up to like 600 kids online at one, at one point with other, other tutors. Wow. Yeah. So um, are you doing online teaching too as well right now? Yes, I'm primarily doing that because... Um, we're, I think we're definitely headed back into a lockdown. Um, Melbourne's pretty bad right now, and Sydney is following. So I'm mostly teaching online. I teach a person in person probably like once to twice a week only. Oh, so you're actually going to the student's house? Are there no, kind of I, I have one student I used to go to their house, and they're, they're begging me to come back right now, and I'm not quite comfortable with it, but I'm, they're mostly coming to my studio. Okay. So my studio is just 10 minutes away from my house, even though I have equipment in here to record, but I have a studio that's 10 minutes away from my home. Now, when you are teaching in this point, one-on-one, um, -on -one, do, do you have a social distancing policy or? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I had somebody work on my house and, and, they, and they, they, they refused to do it, you know, so some people refuse. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes. They're, they're, yes. <laughs> Fortunately, my sec, my second kit and my practice pads or uh, my room is longer sideways, so they're they're far away from me enough. Okay. Okay. And no shaking hands, man. None of that. You know. Yeah. That's all. We, we get the we get the elbow bump, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what they're doing here. The elbow bump. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know me that I've had severe allergies since you know me mm -hmm. so um i'm extremely asthmatic so that would be very crippling to me i'm on i'm on test number three mm -hmm. yeah so fortunately you can get them here easy compared to the states you can walk in and get a test we even do drive-through tests <laughs> Yeah, they're they're try they're doing that here, but I think what happens is um, it it takes a long time. They're, they're they it's kind of a little bit of a mayhem, but they're they're doing the drive through and all that. But cool. people have to wait, you know, to get the results. You get it. You get it here in about twenty four hours. Yeah. Text. If it's negative, you get a text. If it's positive, you get a phone call. Oh, well, that's a good yeah. system. 
Yeah. <laughs> and when I get that text, I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> it's like, you know, winning a lottery. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, I mean, it's, I'm, you know, we were talking about going back into teaching in person and some of the parents are being quite, you know, smart about it. And they've gone, okay, I'll pull back and I'll, I'll wait because I, I want to wait. First, they were really gung-ho about going forward and coming back. And now they're going, oh, let's wait. But I've lost, you know, lost some students, even especially newer students that want to come in right away. And unfortunately, it's been adults that are going, I want to come in. I'm coming in. I'm not going to do online. And you go, well, I, I think you should respect this. Well, come to my house. I'm going, coming to your house is no better to me. It's to you, but I don't feel comfortable. So I'd rather take a loss that way than take a loss. Yeah. I think, um, you know, in, in the situation, I, I've kind of decided to do the same thing because um, here it's, I'm in Alameda County and it's it's actually getting worse. And yeah. so uh, I've decided to, to um, not not teach anywhere. I'll just be at home and I bought some new equipment. I'm just doing it that way. And I think like you, it's like, why even risk it? You know, um, it's, it's, it's not worth it. And I had some people quit, but that's fine. I, um, you know, I just figure that, um, you know, things are changing. They're never going to go back and we're going to move forward into some other, uh, realm and aspect of, of music rather than doing what we used to do. Um, so I'll, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm embracing the change. That's that's yeah, kind of what I'm doing now. You must, and the main thing is what I'm looking at is going. Okay, well, I'm just going to go push forward, and you know, if bigger artists have to do it, then that means that 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 pool is open that we can jump in if they if they can't tour and we have to all record this particular way and and get our material out a particular way have to do things, you know, where they're, you know, doing guest spots online and, you know, playing with each other online and piecing the video together or a live stream if it works. That's what it's going to have to be for a minute. And we've got to adapt or just sit there. Right. You know, I'm, I'd rather be active than just sitting there. So I've already kind of uh, adopted. I've done, I did a duet with, with Charlie Hunter already at, when this first started. So talk about how you uh, how do you record the video? Do you um, do you lay down a drum track and then he plays over it or vice versa? Oh, he just sent me. He was doing these things constantly on social media. He was on Instagram like every day, and I decided to rejoin Instagram because he was saying come interview and people want to know about that particular time in our career together. So I went back on and said okay. So he we did a live interview and goofed around and played and talked music and he ended up just sending me a video of because he had been doing all these things he did one with benny greb did one with you know every every imaginable drummer or percussionist or singer you could you could think of so he just sent it where he clicked and he had a metronome and he clicked and he did a video and played to it and sent it to me and all i did is threw it in the software and of course you know you could play to it just locked up to it like we do <laughs> and filmed myself and sent it back and, you know, synced them up. And that was it. And I, of course I EQ'd a little bit and it's, 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 it's nice. It's, you know, two minutes or something short and sweet, but it's hitting you and it's, it's, it's good. That's what I think it's a great point of what most of us should do. Yeah. Um, I was talking with my other student earlier and, um, we're talking about the technology that, um, you know, playing together uh, over um, a, a video conferencing uh, network is um, soon to improve where we're not going to have the lag and we can actually play together. In time. Uh, yeah, in time. Because, you know, talking about the streaming and how bad that was when we first got like Netflix and you couldn't stream a movie, right? We get we'd get the discs in the mail, and then all of a sudden that's incredible, you know. And we can watch HD movies, and so I yeah. think um, predicting that the same thing, especially now with you know our current state, that we're going to have this opportunity to be able to play together without the lag time. They're going to get the technology together. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely the point. I mean, where, you know, if 
I've, I've been seeing someone, a friend of mine, oh, actually, you know, Rick, um, Ophir, Kelly. Oh, oh so, Ophir, yeah, she, yeah, so she was talking recently to me, and she was sending me all these, because she has a boyfriend here, so she comes out here. <laughs> So I've been in touch with her, and she was sending me this thing. Have you seen what the SF Jazz is doing? I, I'm, I'm uh, just the thing Friday night thing. Is that what they're you're doing? Talking all about? these different. They have a menu of courses they're they're doing online, but they're really promoting for a lot of artists back in the Bay Area as well as outside. So they've had Herbie Hancock, Terrence Blanchard, um, and Wayne Shorter even on their interviewing on Zoom. So just giving people push and, you know, saying how they're, you know, having to change their whole aspects of what they're going to do as well. But it's just some positive encouragement because everyone's got to remember it's like either just stop or find another way because art is always that way. We always, it's never easy. No one said, oh, someone's going to come and give you the golden ticket. It's difficult. It's not a, you know, this is not a thing that's the simple, the simple way. No one's, there's no A&R anymore. There's no, there's no record label. So it's all about the freedom to do what you want. So I think there's some good information on there. I would say have a look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've been getting the Friday. It says Friday night concerts. I think Friday night at five o'clock um or friday late afternoon i i, I get those like every week because i'm i'm um subscribed to their uh email list cool um yeah so a lot of um you know a lot of those places you know they're they're like you said they have to come up with a different way um because you know they can't have big concerts anymore and um a lot of people are doing these, and I don't know what you think about this. They have uh, no audience, and they'll play a gig, and they have masks on. You know, people are doing that. I don't. It's a little funny to me, but because um, the audience to me is the is the whole reaction of of playing out. You know, um, it's good to play with humans. We talk about playing with humans, and and and. Yeah you know good to, that's how we have to learn how to play music is with other human beings rather than playing with tracks um yeah but um to play with other human beings but you're playing a gig but nobody's there and like they have like sports with no audience and they're piping in like audience you know soundtrack you know uh like a a, a applauding track like back in the um, old school with a, of a tv show right and that's what you're talking about, right? <laughs> um, but it's it's different, and I don't know if I'm okay. I mean, it's great to play a gig, but I don't know if I'd go after something like that. It's not really appealing to me um, to play a gig like with masks on and in a club with nobody there, and and the club is like trying to survive because everybody's going bankrupt, you know, because of yeah. no, you know, no, no, uh, no income. So. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that, but it, it's a little different for me. I think it's, I mean, it's a little bit of the, you know, the word, the sign of the times for now. I mean, if, if, you, can, if you can somewhat accept it for a moment, the only other option is, you know, play in a small room or a mid-sized room and don't wear a mask, even um, th that is outside that and still no audience. That's the only other way I was going to do it in my own studio because I had enough room for, you know, a quartet to a trio. And, I mean, vice versa, but I was going to do that myself and just play together and maybe wear masks, but in, in a medium-sized room and just broadcast it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one thing I'm, I'm thinking of doing. And that's different than playing in a club, I think, because in the club you're, you're actually – they're 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 trying to do it like you would a club gig, and then they're they're uh, broadcasting it. But you're saying like in your personal space. Yeah, because it's what I got, and then I, you know, there's 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 a big hall that's near me. They're starting to do the full production where they're broadcasting it, and they're remotely broadcasting from different venues around the city, which I think is cool. I mean, it, it's especially for you know up and coming artists because. 
it gives them a little something to hold on to because a lot of people don't realize, you know, we're coming, you and I are coming from a different era where we had to be self-motivated. We had to be self-driven. And a lot of these newer kids, and I'll say it because we're still mentoring them and I'm mentoring them. I'm doing vocals. I'm doing any kind of thing I'm, you know, producing and I'm mentoring kids and teaching them audio. And they're thinking, you know, still get on a TV show and someone's going to come and discover him and, you know, hold the hand and walk him down the street and give him $2 million. I'm going, that don't happen no more. It's up to you. So I think it's good for these kids to see these self, you know, promoted gigs and you go around and do it in a venue. Yeah, there's no one there, but it's hopefully giving them some, keeping their hunger alive. Mm hmm. Because, you know, some of them, they think it's only about what people are getting from them. I don't really care about that anymore. I just, it's it's like eating and drinking for me. I just, I wake up motivated. It's just what, what I do. It's music. You know, it's what we do. You know what I mean? I I just love it. And I think they, so it's, it's kind of like they need that sort of motivation. I need motivation, but I think it's really a lot for the, for the younger generation that need that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of the um, younger generation is is mostly on social media, um, and and you know the um, Instagram, uh, and I see a lot of drummers on that. You know, um, it's blown up. It's blown up, and and they're and they're incredible drummers. I mean, it's, and and I I um I just I listen to the drum sounds, and they're incredible. It's like I don't even know what they're how they're recording, but it's it's it sounds great. You're hearing yeah. that production, and you're going, "What's that? How you right? How you getting that sound?" <laughs> yeah, it's like a minute, right? And then you have to click over to that LG TV or whatever that is. Yeah, IG TV. But yeah, it's amazing. It's like they're all amazing and 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 playing great. They're not playing with anybody, but they're, you know, they're kind of doing their their drum solo feature and and i love it all i gotta say i mean it's 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 all really amazing to me <laughs> the calisthenics of it all but calisthenics, you know, yeah uh, you know it it's and now it's turning to to that a little bit where it's going okay is it just going to be the gymnastics of it and and that's what people are going towards watching that as well but at least those kids are you know staying motivated but i just think that a lot of the newer generation, that's all they know. And they think if you've made it there, you're someone big, you know, not thinking about all the other years you've spent doing bigger things than being on the small screen to them. Mm -hmm. So th th they need to see that side too, where, you know, I think, you know, it'd be cool to see you do a, a live thing or, or even a duet, even online and just post it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting into stuff. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I've got like you talking about motivation. I've, I've, uh, I've been doing these courses, and I did about um, I don't know eight to ten hours. Uh, I actually been wor I worked on one yesterday where I just did all. I'm just trying to give like the history of everything I've ever done, and try to get it on video, which is kind of crazy because there's so much information and i'm not i'm trying to get away from the seven minute video five seven minute video which i've done before and i'm we trying to make it a course so um and then as i do things i go oh i got i left out this and i got to put that in i got to put this in and and i and my video video quality has to be good the audio has to be good the, you know i have to make sure that i i i speak well so i'm, I'm really um being very hard on myself and doing yeah. it but at the same time it gives me a lot of energy because i feel um you know really um it, it's really inspiring to, to try to pass on the tradition of of all the things i've learned and and pass it on to to whoever you know um i hope people will understand it though i'm not i'm not the calisthenic drummer you know i never was but i i am into i am into the art and and into sharing you know, um, so uh, I think that um, like these things you, you mentioned, like trying to do duets or do a live session. I, I mean, these are the things I'm really interested in and, uh, and and understanding how to do it. In fact, I wish there was more courses on how to do things because a lot of the stuff I have to kind of figure it out myself. There's nobody to really call, you know, <laughs> um, so, such uh, as. 
you know, the, the, the computer stuff, um, you know, oh, trying, sure, but that's my thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm um, my, okay. So somebody I went to Berkeley with who actually played with Herbie Hancock. Uh, do you know Gene Jackson? We've talked about mean Gene. We call him GJ. So, uh, don't you remember I saw him once and I told you I flipped out. I was going, man, his touch. Yeah. Yeah. I saw him. I think I saw him with maybe Dave Holland or someone. Dave maybe Holland. Right. Right. Yeah. He just, he, I went, People like him, I, I've, I'll, you know, especially we've got the internet now and social media. I sorted, you know, found him and went on and said thank you at one point. I think maybe ten years ago, and he was just like, "What? Who are you?" And I something I just and I think you had told me you went to Berkeley when he was there. Yeah, we were at said, Berkeley together. Yeah, I said one of my teachers is went to Berkeley at the time you went. He was like, "Oh, but thank you for the compliment." Yeah, he was really cool. He's a he's a sweetheart, and and um, you got to understand at Berkeley at that time there was there was kind of there's a lot of kind of um, you know uh, clicks of, of, of different 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 things going on. Um, Gene was always the most beautiful person, and and he would play in his room. He had something. He had a special gift, you know, and. We check everybody out in the practice rooms, and uh, Gene had this this thing, man. Um, it, he was so amazing, and um, you know he went on to do great gigs. I I um, he's on Facebook, and I I asked him. I go, well, hey, I'm 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 trying to like get my computer stuff together, and uh, I'm thinking about making like building a computer. And he sent me this seven page, you know, um, PDF of like all his computer bills because he kind of he, he mentioned it one time. Yeah. You know, I built this computer, you know, and I put Macintosh hardware on it, um, Apple hardware or ap Apple software. And uh, God, he just sent me this whole like detailed list of links. And it was like, wow. And he goes, yeah, this is what's in my drum room. And this is what's in my main room. This is my first build. This is my second build. It's my third yeah. build. Yeah, it you was just do, amazing. One there called Mock Max. There's a, a bunch of, because, well, because Mac is going, now they're going to do their own chip again. And, yes. and the price is going up for just a tower. You could spend like, you know, if you fully pimp one out, you're looking at almost five grand. Uh, well, here... The towers are starting. the 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 this, the base model is six grand. Maybe that's what I'm in. I'm I'm wrong because I don't use those anymore. So I'm just going. I heard the price went. Who? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and um, you know we love the. I have a couple of the the towers and I love them. You know, yeah. uh, they're tanks. You know, um, but what happens is when the software changes, the um, you know like. I use Final Cut Pro, and okay. um, I use Pro Tools, and, and um, Pro Tools is good on the old machine, but uh, uh, I can't, the Final Cut Pro, once they, they stopped, you know, like, I can't get upgrades, and then, yeah, um, yeah it's the OS not system, they're going up to these different OS, and your machine won't run them, and, but the other part is now is everything is on their own proprietary um their own, you know, miniature jack, and then you have to get all the adapters and all that type of stuff. What if your interface is Firewire, and you know, all your so you can't run most of your um, peripherals, your 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 right. hard drives, and all those different things, and you have to spend almost two hundred bucks to get them to even connect to your new machine. Right. Yeah, they call it uh, Thunderbolt Three. Yeah, even though some of my machines do have their, you know, midway in both areas, so they have Thunderbolt, but just going that full on, it's just, it's, it's you know, maybe one day or maybe I'll just have to make my own like that, mm -hmm. which it's possible because I've seen other people do super ones for, you know, for about a grand or less. So yes, that might that be the next that's point. what Gene's talking about, and getting um, you know he he buys used um, hardware and oh, yeah. and and he puts it together. It's very inspiring to me, and and uh, you know uh, I'm looking at it, but I can't find I can't find the stuff. To me, it's like um, I when I try to, to to spec it out, it's like up into two thousand dollars, and you know it's like ah, I don't know if I want to spend that. But uh, no, if it's, you got to find refurbished places that do um, Mac refurbs. And 
you know, you can search eBay and you'll find somebody that does a bunch of them where they keep flipping them back over. So some, um, do you remember when I did IT work? Uh, no. <laughs> I was doing IT work around 99, 2000. Uh -huh. I was working in, um, um, this, yeah, I was still studying with you then, heavily. I was um, working at BB's Women Clothing Company in Burlingame. And I was I one of the that. IT guys. Yeah, I was in IT. Okay. So I was actually head of hardware. Um, so I would be the guy that re re would recycle the hardware and the place that recycled it, all the hardware too was beneath my studio space, downtown studios. <laughs> so I would find people like that and find all the gear that they flip and then take it in and build new machines out of it. Mm. Or I would take out the bits and build new machines there. Mm. So that's what I've been doing is refurbishing even my iMacs. I've got three iMacs and I've got two laptops. Mm. So out of refurbished equipment and, you know, find the newest bits and find out what you need and find the, t you know, the best, um, best ones and go and have a fast machine. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, really, it's, it's really inspiring and I'm, I'm getting into it. I, I, I yeah. was actually looking at buying something old and trying to, um, uh, upgrade it, but I think I'm going towards the gene route, you know, with like just, just kind of putting stuff together and that way, uh, I can always change oh, yeah. components, but, uh, it's really amazing. And, and like you said, like trying to get something that's fast and that we can do, uh, you know, art on, you know, can do, yeah. do uh, artistic software. So that's, that's, uh, that's really exciting to me. Yeah. But the thing is, um, if you're going to stick with pro tools, pro tools is the one that's like loading different, once you start loading at least, you know, five or 10 plugins, it just, it sucks up power. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I'm using, I'm back to using Logic and I'm using Ableton and Logic and they run pretty, pretty smooth on, on the minimal amount of memory, even though I can go full memory, but they just, they don't need as much memory. So, um, Talk about the Ableton and, and talk about uh, um, the Logic. Do, do they, do you have lag problems at all recording or uh, what do you use for an interface? Um, for, well, here I'm using just uh, just two channels. I'm using one of the Scarlet, um, the focus rights, you know, the red one you've seen a million times. Oh, I4 so, or something. Yeah, um, two, two by two, that one. I'm running that one and then I'm running it into... Um, just into an iMac that's fully blown, and I'm running, I'm running Logic and Cubase. I mean, sorry, Logic and um, Cubase and Ableton on this machine. Then I got another laptop sitting here um, that's running um, Logic and Ableton as well. That's if I need to go portable somewhere and just do sequencing and whatnot and just full-on recordings. But I'm and I'm running a lot of Icon Pro equipment, which is a newer company. Um, I'm, I'm one of their artists now, so I'll be running more audio interfaces from them, but I'm running one of their main controllers, which is flying faders. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, you'll see me with, I'll be running two different, um, interfaces. So I'll be running 30, um, what is it? 16 channels. So I'll be running 16 channels on that in my studio with two, inter, um, two, two controllers. So I'll be running, um, 16 tracks, tracks, flying faders. Wow. But um, my main interface mixer is one of those personas, the uh, Studio One. I mean, Studio Live with the, it's basically a mixer, which is an interface, a Firewire mixer. And that thing sounds amazing. It's one of the older ones, one of the first editions. And it's, it still sounds amazing. And I'm running um, some Personas 2 preamps as well. And some, not very much outboard gear, mostly um, plugins. Some outboard gear, but I'm I'm not really that worried about it anymore because it's going away from that. Are going you in the box? Are, are you recording drums there too? And yeah. You're, and you're okay. And and yeah. are you are you using so using the Firewire mixer to um, uh, to record your drums? Yes. And um, I'm still mainly mixing in the box. I mean, even though I have the capabilities to mix on the mixer but I'm mixing in the box. So I just do like a pre-mix. Um, most of the projects I'm still, I'm usually working with some other engineer or something, but I'll, I'm, I'm pre-engineering my stuff enough mm. where it's 
it's pretty it's pretty um happening before it leaves me <laughs> wow yeah i've heard the productions are they're incredible i'm i'm trying i'm working on more on the engineering side a little bit to where i get a better mix where it because before, you know, people think it's about the you mixing your drums. If you're working with someone else, it's about usually that's they want to do that. They want to mix your drums. They want raw files. Mm. But I've been trying to get it to the point to where I, I mix them a little bit to where when they hear them, because I'll send them a sample of, you know, me playing on top of it first. So I'll try to mix it as best as possible to make it, make them excited. Wow. You know what I mean? So where they just go, oh, yeah. Because if the drums sound flat, they're not going to be like, oh, it's a beautiful kit, but it sounds eh. So I put a little, you know, I'll EQ it some and give them some excitement. <laughs> yeah, because I think I agree with you. Um, uh, when I first got my Pro Tools rig, um, one of my students has actually my uh, built my studio and, um, you know, set everything up. He used to work at, uh, what was that, um, uh, Studio 8080, but... Uh, um, was the uh, um, the the famous band? Uh, um, they were. He, there was all these these kind of things. He was working. He was working for Metallica. What is it? No, I'm trying to remember that. Studio. Where was that? It's, it's in Oakland. Um, Green Day was working there. And, oh, uh, okay. So yeah, no. He, it was in a really bad part of town. But it was like they, you know, you drive into a, a warehouse, and then it was this, you know, nice studio. It wasn't really state of the art, but I mean, they had a lot of equipment. But it was, you know, it was a little to me. It was a little older, you know. But it was big. It had a lot of room. Well, that's what the other thing. Though I actually had a big discussion recently with a student here, and I had to go, you know, because he was now he's becoming because he's engineers as well. So he's done that with me as well as drums. And he's amazing, both. And I just went, you can't get excited just because I understand you're the younger generation, so you see all the gear and you think it's amazing. It must sound great. You know, everything is the brand new stuff. I said, you, I, I'm coming from tape. <laughs> I say, I walk in and see a tape machine and see a decent decent room and, you know, good, good mics. It doesn't have to have, you know, all Neumanns or something have to have decent mics mm. i'm excited it's about i'm looking at the guy who's behind the console instead of what's all around the room mm -hmm. it does the room just have decent acoustics because there's been rooms that you know think about it you know it, rooms you walk into you start clapping and you go mm, drum's gonna sound amazing in here and i'm not worried about much else you know it's got decent preamps if the guy can pull tones and i can tune a drum kit i'm i'm good to go they could have the most expensive stuff and the engineer sucks. <laughs> yeah. I've actually experienced a lot of that. Um, where um, the drums sound horrible and I don't yeah, know yeah. what happens. And I, I think I've made some suggestions and it was, you know, really nice studios, state of the art, but I don't know what, you know, like uh, it, it, it comes out sounding horrible. And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, like you, I have in the box, and I mixed it my, my last year, and it came out great, you know, it came out amazing. So I, I don't quite understand that, like what, what happens. Because what, somebody is hearing, a, a, you know, you, then you go back to the old school of where you bring a CD in, and you go, listen to this, this is what I'm sort of after. That's the old school production thing, which some people forget about that, you know, I... I mixed one group that, or I even recorded a, a metal group that wanted to sound like, you know, particular group and they went somewhere else that was state of the art. And they went, you did it in your, you know, so-so studio. And I'm going, yeah, because you told me what you were into. And I was teaching the drummer and I knew what to, I knew what to get out of you. But um, it, it's, it's, it's not always just the gear, it's about the ear. That sounds like a rhyme. <laughs> It's not about the ear, it's about the ear. Well, look at your man. You know, look at, I still give Weckl huge, huge, huge credit. I think people go, Weckl's a sick drummer, blah, blah, blah. They forget about the other side of what he does and what he's been doing since we, we saw him come onto the scene almost with Chick. 
he's been engineering his own drums. Yeah, he's got a I remember, great video. Yeah, his, but it's not that much gear. You don't not see that all much the gear, but it's not. He's got nice, nice stuff. And, and he and knows what he's doing because you know, he mixes really well. He's got a good ear. I guess you're you're right. It's coming down to that. Yeah. Uh, him and his partner uh, Jay Oliver. They they yep. they work together and they got that. Um, you know, they got the ear down. So um, they do really well in the production. And he knows what he's doing with it. So a lot of people. The other part of people running out and buy everything new. I buy this new. This coming out every six months. I'm gonna go. I'm sell this and I buy that. Like I've I know one guy has got tremendous gear here and you see him you know on I'll, I'll buy used gear sometime or i'll sell stuff and i'll see his stuff for sale and i'm just going wow you just got that and I've, i'm like how could you even learn it in six months <laughs> you know there's a point of there's a you know you got to get per past that learning curve that's like saying i got rudiments down i've been doing them for six months hmm. Do you, is that possible no <laughs> And I think about, you know, the things I'm still working on. Um, so I would I remember watching Weckl, you know, back in the eighties, sitting there reaching back behind him to that refrigerator amps, you know, those big old stacks he had behind him and stuff. And he was mixing his drums and I didn't know what he was doing as much. And his sound is always always killer. Yes. Because he's, he's mixing. He prides himself on that and tuning and, and, and uh, you know, he's very detail-oriented. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he might not always be my favorite or whatever, but I give him credit for his overall package, and people need to learn from that. It's going, he was doing it before the whole craze started, but he did it at, in a very immaculate way to where it, it didn't need that sort of hype. Mm -hmm. Class. I, I got to say, um, with, with the play-alongs, um, he seems to have the best package as far as, you know, um, great charts. There's been a few mistakes, but, but um, overall, great. Uh, great recording, uh, easy to play along with, very clear. Where other play-along packages, it seems like they're pretty disjointed, you know, and... Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's they're not, you know, like the production and, and the clarity, you know, it's it's not always there, you know. Um, so I got to say that that he's done really well in the education department, um, yeah. you know, as far as putting those those packages out. And, um, you know, when that first package, it was called Contemporary Drummer Plus One or Minus yeah. One. That was killer when that came out. You know, that was like you know we all got that and it was hard you know the tunes were hard and <laughs> there'd be like you know different styles and like a jingle and a movie soundtrack and then you know stuff with like some fusion tunes straight ahead tunes and yeah. rock tunes funk tunes r and b um so i you know i think he does really well with with you know he he had a really nice project and and he he hired studio musicians and you know yeah. um i thought it was really great and i still love that stuff today you know um and i use I still, it i still i still own his first dvd i mean first yeah videotape vhs the the the, the what is it called Con uh back to the basics yeah, I still own all that stuff, and I still, you know, I don't laugh at anything because whatever happened is still relevant. You know, people go like, oh, this is the new. I was like, there's nothing new. It's a matter of approach. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, you know, it's a matter of approach. It's just like saying a tape machine is outdated because I've got this, this laptop, which most people run. Um, it's just a source of holding the information. So I feel like Going back to that stuff, I still never mastered what he was doing. You know, it's st it's still relevant to learn from it, just as well as even the Terry Basio first terrible DVD. I mean, VHS sounds awful. That that Remo kit. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, what was that one? That was um, it was he had gone with Remo, and then he started doing the um, solo drums, and he was coming up with all the concepts, but the sound. It was the acoustic tile, acoustic. Some. It was a concept they were using. No, no, they, no. The, it's just that kit just was awful. He, yeah. It was, and then he 
later on wasn't even playing that kid. He was playing Keller Shells. It, it just badged as, as a remote kid. Oh, is that what it was? Because I remember he went to Mapex and then he went to DW. He was with, yeah, with, with Mapex was okay, but yeah. But um, yeah, but that video, even just whoever mixed it was, was out of their mind. It just, and that room sounded terrible. So that, that one was terrible. But it, just some of the concepts, you see where he was going. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, I still own all those, you know, Clayton Cameron, the, the brushes one and all that stuff. It's information that, you know, if you go, man, I'm, I'm, I'm lost on information. Where should I go today? I'll go back to something like that. I still have every single le lesson you, you've, you've written. I have a, I have a folder like that here. Wow. Today. It's in my studio. So I was, that was going to be um, another one of my questions is how has that material or that curriculum helped you that when you studied with me, those, you know, um, and those lessons back then, how did that curriculum help you and how, how, like what, what struck you in my teaching style or my curriculum? Um, it was, it was always well worked out. Um, it was always clear and it always had, um, a goal in mind, and we moved along fairly quickly, even though I was lagging because life and work, but it always had a ending goal, and we were progressing quite quickly, even if you didn't see it in your own plan, or, you know, you might have wanted me to go faster, but it would come out, if you did the work, it would come out, and to the point where you would go out on, a, I would go out on a gig, and I was speaking a different language. You, you understand what I mean? So it was coming out. It transformed quickly. you. Is that what you mean by that? Like you're, you're, you're transformed into, you're, you're applying the material to your, um, quickly. To, to your situation. A little too quickly for some other people playing with me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know who this guy is. But it was, you know, I was progressing quite quickly, and um, it's still relevant today. You know, all the information, all the, you know, because now linear has become hip, and it was always hip, but now it's the, the main thing. And, you know, doing a lot of those things are still, you know, it's a big primary thing of my playing. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, I, when I had to play really syncopated, um, I was playing sort of syncopated, but once I really understood what you were giving me was all the music I listened to, it was all the information I wanted to gain. And it's, it's there and I'm, I'm using it today. Tremendously I, today. I remember doing um, the odd, it was a Louis Belson odd time text. I remember doing mm -hmm. that. I, I think we did the whole book. Yeah. And, and the Gary Chafee stuff a bit too. We did Gary Chafee stuff. Um, and I remember some hand technique and then um, some drum set concepts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just remember doing a lot of, we did a lot of reading and yeah. focusing. I think we focused a lot on, on getting that going. Yes, because I was probably, because I was starting to do jingles a little bit and I didn't talk about it as much, but I, and people didn't ask me to read as much, but I wanted to be able to read just in case that wall happened of me not memorizing quickly and it was helping me to write down some sort of um, bizarre noting notational stuff to really learn quicker and I would you know no one asked me to write out stuff but I would you know have a gig the next day or something and I would you know learn the music by memory but I would still be scared about certain sections so I learned but from learning that I learned how to write out different notes and to count better you know so really understanding where Someone says, I want you to come in on the and of four. You know, a lot of people don't get that, how important that is. You can go, I can just, I want to just play. And I just, you know, I'll pick it up. I'll cheat and I'll follow. But learning, to, someone tells you where that is, that's huge. You know, so you might not have to learn how to read a chart. And that really helped me. All that stuff is big today. As, as much as me showing, you know, some kid playing classical music. I'm teaching or whatever, going, but can you just communicate without this piece of paper in front of you? Can you communicate if someone said where I want you? 
So the counting, big, huge. Oh, you, huge. Applying the counting to your to your um, to your playing and and the communication from learning the language. Oh yeah, and being able to pass that on to someone else and go. If someone just walked up and told you where it is, it's like saying it's across the street from the blah blah blah. And someone gives you a landmark. So you see it, you get there to the landmark without GPS, because I look at the chart as GPS. Take the GPS away and just proper, you know, language communication that you're able to follow that language and get to that destination. So, you know, saying it's on the blah, 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 it's on this beat or, or that beat, it makes it quite clear that, you know, if someone doesn't understand those basic I, concepts, they won't, they won't know where they're going. Yeah, so it's 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 slower, it's slower to communicate because you you uh, there's no way to to um, express the or or speak the language, so you end up wasting time. Where if yeah. you know the language, you you can get things a lot faster. Well, think about you might have been in a rehearsal with a less musical person, and you 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 know sitting there, which drummers are always the ones that get pointed to and go, they don't understand theory. They don't understand this and that, and you're going, that person doesn't, and I, it's taking them longer to learn this, and I know exactly where it is, but you're having to listen to this person fumble to tell this person in, in about 10 different ways how to get to one simple um, part of the arrangement. So it wastes time. Yeah, or I want you to come in on the upbeat. Yeah. <laughs> or the end of the blah, blah, blah. You know, here's a pickup. You know, people go, oh, what, what's a pickup? <laughs> so I think all that, it's, I mean, I know that's very, 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 it's hugely important. You can play along the records all you want and get the feel and get a groove and learn the arrangements, but you take that away and you go, I got to play with a bass player alone and play arrangement. There, There is, that's a big, big, that's a big task if you have no sort of, concept of those sort of things i think so um another question is is that um the skills uh needed you know drumming skills that are important learning how to read um uh, learning rudiments learning styles like what would you what would you say important um important skills to have and it could be as a drummer or musician uh you talked about uh, learning um theory um playing maybe different instruments um so what what would be your take on that um i would say i would say probably everyone might not be drawn to another instrument or just you know the fear of another instrument. Um, if in, even if you don't play it, understand it. Mm. Understand it. You know, the reason what I mean by understand it is say, okay, this person is playing this, and you being able to follow that story of this person is going up and down. Really pay attention to guitar or piano or keyboard because they're telling the story. The bass player is, but they're the root. The you know, say it's a guitar bass group it's you know and that person's playing really playing the root of it you follow that and it's teaching you so much learn to listen to guitar music and pay attention to more of that than you're paying attention to the drums and you're learning where to go you're learning how to move around in the arrangement the root is the root instrument it's going to help you out if you walk into a recording session and play quickly and that's a big thing i think don't listen to records just as a drummer so listen for the other instruments and, and trying to uh, center yourself on their parts. Yeah, because you might be listening to the, you know, the first thing you're hearing is the, the keyboard is playing the chords uh, uh, and telling you where to go. It's, it's giving you the root of everything. So really learn how to read that story. And don't think about your drum parts. Think about the keyboard parts or whatever parts because they're telling you what to play and what not to play how to stay out of the way and actually to compliment. That's my understanding. It's, and it's worked, you know, for me for quite some time, fortunately. Great. Yeah, so, so, uh, go on, sorry. I'm just, um, 
I just wanted to, to ask you one more question in closing. Um, what would you, what kind of recommendations or advice would you give to, uh, let's say, you know, younger, the younger music, musical generation growing up in, the, in this time, um, what could they do um, in the music business now? And, and uh, how could they have a voice in the music business in this present time? Um, I would say really learn about the business side of it, you know, really help your fellow um, musician, if you understand, or artists, if you understand anything about the music business, not just uh, how to make it musically, but how to handle your business financially and whatnot, and how not to, you know, sign anything without... Um, understanding or speaking to a lawyer or an elder that understands what you what you're going to sign but mainly really learn how to do most of the technology of what we've been speaking about on your own learn how to run the technology and record and do most of it or or a good majority of it on your own save yourself money of going somewhere somewhere else that's that's what i feel so learn learn software learn um, learn technology and try to be self sufficient yes and it's you know what a lot of older artists were already saying to a lot of them and they don't get it and it's what it, it's come down to there is no music industry you know like it was and and being a person that's been on labels that's been signed in x or whatever now it's about us it's, it's truly empowerment we have the power it's look at us speaking across the internet look at us being able to send you know files across the internet and then a finished product comes out it's it's really about that it's just it's about us that's what i feel awesome hey simone thanks for doing this and um as always you know uh, it's it's great to see you and keeping in touch and and um, you know uh, hearing about your projects and and different things over the years. So um, I totally appreciate it. Oh, and um, anything else you want to say in closing? Everyone learn the basics, and it's 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 our communication skills. Learn the basics on any instrument. It's it's language, and it's how you communicate with another artist when you play. That's all I got to say. Awesome. All right, Simone. Thank well, you, I'll let you get back to it and, you know, uh, stay safe out there and, and uh, keep positive and I'll see you on the upturn. All right, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Rob.